flower art. Today I'm going to introduce you to four artists that became very well known for their flower art. The goal today is to give you some insight as to why and how artists make flower art and show you some examples to help you get inspired to create art featuring this wonderful versatile theme. Almost since the beginning of recorded history, flowers have appeared in artworks. There's a good reason for that, because flowers have become a symbol. A symbol is a picture that stands for an idea. And some of the ideas that flowers stand for are love. We think about flowers in a romantic way. When you um, care about someone, you give them flowers. Other symbols include positivity. Some people just feel good when they look at flowers. Other people associate flowers with springtime or nature and some people even associate flowers with beauty. The next artists that we're going to be talking about all feature flowers in their artwork, but they have very different styles. They, have they use very different media, which means materials to create their artwork, and there are very different feelings that are associated with that art. The first artist we're going to look, look at is Vincent van Gogh. He was a Dutch artist born in the Netherlands in 1853. These three pieces that you're seeing are some of his most famous work of art. The Starry Night is probably one of the most famous works of art in all of the world. So it's important to note that he didn't just paint flowers, but he did paint some very beautiful flower pictures. The interesting thing to know about Vincent van Gogh is he was only an artist for about 10 years. He started creating art late in life and he died very tragically very early. He battled with mental illness and actually lived in a mental institution created most of the works of art that you see in that institution. He had a very tragic life, but some art historians say that it was that pain that he went through that created such passion in his artworks. One of Van Gogh's most famous flower paintings was Sunflowers, painted in 1889. One of the things to know about Vincent Van Gogh's art is that he used a lot of texture. He actually painted so thickly that you can actually see the paint coming up off of the canvas. This is a technique called impasto. And sometimes artists would even take a palette knife instead of a brush to apply the paint right to the canvas. And it's done so thickly that sometimes they even mix the colors right on the canvas. Something that sets Van Gogh's work apart is his use of lines. If you'll notice in this picture of the irises, you can see some almost strong outlines um, where he painted in the forms before he started adding the colors. This gives it almost a cartoonish quality that some people really strongly associate with Vincent van Gogh's work. Color also plays a key role in Vincent van Gogh's artwork. He liked to use bright, vibrant colors that are often brighter than we actually see them. This may have something to do with how he felt about what he was looking at. Sometimes artists see things in different ways and we use colors to express our emotions. How can you use color in your artwork to make the viewer feel happy or excited or fearful or anxious? The next artist we're gonna look at is Georgia O'Keeffe. She was an American artist born in 1887. And some people even call her the mother of American modernism. She was one of the first women artists to become famous here in America. She was born on a Wisconsin farm in 1800s, and she was 99 years old when she died. But unlike Van Gogh, she painted for over 80 years. You can imagine she's got a lot of artwork to show for that time. Since she grew up on a farm, she was fascinated by nature, so it's no surprise that flowers became one of her most famous subjects. Even though she became famous for painting her flowers, it's important to know that like most artists, she painted a variety of things. One of her favorite things to paint was the places that she lived. Two of the places she lived was New York and New Mexico. You can imagine that both of those places being so different gave her a lot of different things and ideas to paint. One of the things you notice right away about Georgia O'Keeffe's flowers is how large they are. When a subject fills the canvas in the space like this and there's hardly any background, this is called a close-up. Sometimes the subject even seems to fall right off the page. This makes it larger and easier for us to see the details. 
Another thing to note about Georgia O'Keeffe's backgrounds is that even though there's not a, much, not a lot of the background, she left them fairly empty and fairly blank. We think this is to put more focus on the beautiful flowers. Something else that we observe in Georgia O'Keeffe's art is her use of texture and value. Texture is the way that something feels. So if you look at it, it may look like that it would feel rough or bumpy or smooth or even sticky. She liked to use smooth texture. So you'll notice in these flowers, there's not a lot of um, indication that if we touched it, it would feel uh, rough or bumpy. It looks like it would feel just as smooth as it looks. Value is something else she really took um, advantage of. Value is the lightness or darkness of a color. So you'll notice that in, in the pictures, when there's a blue flower, for instance, there is a really good range of dark, dark blues all the way up to light, light blues that are almost white and everything in between. This also gives us um, the illusion that something is three-dimensional, helps make your drawings and paintings look more real. Later on in life, Georgia O'Keeffe started to paint these abstracted flowers. The word abstract means it doesn't look realistic. Um, there's something about it that is off or wrong. And in this case, it looks like these flowers are so close up that we don't even see anything else. And the abstraction white rose could be a very close up of a rose, or it might just be shapes that look like flowers. Now that we've looked at art from two different artists, let's do a little compare and contrast. The picture on the left is by Vincent Van Gogh. That's his iris picture. And the picture on the right is Blue Morning Glories by Georgia O'Keeffe. Let's take a look and see what is similar, what, is, what we can compare about them, and what is different, what we can contrast. Well, they're both blue flowers. That's a similarity. We, that's a comparison. Um, they're both paintings. Um, the artist didn't use any other materials but, um, like collage or sculpture. These are both painted on a canvas. Um, contrast, what is different about them? Well, um, in the Georgia O'Keeffe, there's only two flowers and they're much, much larger. They fill up the whole space. And in the Van Gogh, there's many flowers, like you would see them in nature, a grouping of flowers. The blue still seems to fill the space though because there are so many of them. Um, the detail. Um, in the Georgia O'Keeffe, the texture is nice and smooth and you feel like if you were to touch it, it would be smooth. But the Van Gogh uses that thick impasto brushstroke. So if I feel like if I touched it, it would feel rough and bumpy. Even though these are the same subject, you can tell that these artists really interpreted them in very different ways. The next artist is Harold Feinstein. He was born in Coney Island, New York. He was American but he's a first generation American, which means that his mother and his father were not born here in America. His mother was Austrian and his father was Russian. Since he grew up in Coney Island, one of his favorite things to take pictures of were street scenes, meaning scenes of everyday life. Now Coney Island is known for its amusement park and a gathering of people from all over the place. So there's often very interesting people to see and that's what he liked to, to photograph. He used um, traditional photography, which means he used a camera with film and he would develop the film and he would print the pictures using chemicals. This is the way that it had always been done since photography was first invented. And the pictures that you see here were taken with a traditional camera. When traditional photography came on the scene in the mid 1800s. It was a complete game changer for artists. No longer did they have to spend weeks or months painting something. They could quickly snap a picture, and now we have a record of our history. It was incredible. Fast forward about 100 years, and digital photography came on the scene. The first digital camera was actually invented in the 1970s, but digital cameras weren't really available for commercial use until the 1990s. Harold Feinstein um, had been using traditional cameras for decades, and he understood what a change this was. The ability to, to capture images digitally and edit them that way was a complete game changer once again. So he was one of the first artists to really get um, experiment with digital photography and more specifically, scanography. Scanography is actually taking photographs using a flatbed scanner. 
Um, a flatbed scanner was just uh, an improvement over a big, huge, clunky copy machine. So scanners and digital cameras became popular in the 1990s and really changed the game. A lot of um, Harold Feinstein's photographs are actually created on a flatbed scanner by laying the plants and flowers right on the scanner. Photographing a subject, Feinstein liked to get very, very close. This is called macro photography meaning an extreme close-up, usually um, of small things that are living, like plants and insects. This gives us a chance to see something in a way we wouldn't normally. How many times have you passed a flower and not given it a second look? Next time you see one, try to get real close up and notice the details, like on this pink and yellow poppy. You can even see some of the pollen that's come off of the little stamens that are sticking up. Could this translate into your artwork? Could you make an extreme close-up artwork of a flower instead of trying to show the whole flower? How would that change what you're seeing and how you feel about it? Something you might notice about Feinstein's photographs are that the backgrounds are almost completely empty. When an artist is thinking about creating a picture, whether it's a photograph or a painting or a collage, you think about the subject and then you think about the background. The subject is what the picture is about. What do you want the viewer to pay attention to? And the background is the space that surrounds the subject. So in this case, he was getting a very, very close up look on these flowers and it makes the colors so vibrant to be so close to it. He chose to create a very blank black background so that the colors would pop. How can you do this in your artwork? Can you choose colors for the background that will make your subject stand out? What if on the Dutch Fair Tulip, he had used a yellow or an orange background? Would it have looked as, as good? All right, time for a little compare and contrast. The picture on your left is Tissue Paper Poppy by Harold Feinstein, and the picture on the right is Red Poppy by Georgia O'Keeffe. Two different artists that we've looked at, but the same subject. Not only the same subject of flowers, but the same specific type of flower, a poppy. So comparison, well, they're both poppies. Um, both of the backgrounds are blank. That's an interesting thing to look about it. And they're both close-ups. Both pictures have a single flower filling the whole space. The things that sets them apart a little bit is, well, they're different colors. One poppy is red and one poppy is white. Um, they're also uh, not the same medium. One is a painting, the Georgia O'Keeffe is a painting, and the Feinstein is a photograph, so that does make, make them a little bit different. Um, the texture and the details, if you look at the photograph, it almost looks like you could feel what that, um, that petal would look like, and it's kind of thin and crinkly, kind of like tissue paper. The poppy is very smooth. Georgia O'Keeffe has used a lot of value in there to make her petals seem very smooth but they do look 3D because she's used a range of darks and lights. The backgrounds are both blank and empty, but one is black and one is white. What do you think would have happened to the tissue paper poppy had Feinstein put that against a white background? Would you be able to see the flower as well? Next flower art that we're gonna look at doesn't come from a single artist, but from a group of artists. There's a creative studio in Los Angeles, California called Play Lab. They were founded in 2009. And basically what this is, it's a group of artists, designers, and producers that create things for people. Um, like uh, a lot of different things that they create are graphic designs, um, packaging, um, they create events. Some of their clients are Adidas and Art Institute of Chicago and Bruno Mars. The picture that you see here was actually um, featured in a Paris runway show, a fashion show. And a lot of times um, when you see fashion shows, they, it seems a little over the top, but they created this whole woodland scene and it was featured right in that runway show. So these groups of creative artists do a lot of different things. And one of the things that they did was create flowers for an exhibition in New York City. In 2018, Play Lab created an exhibition called Grown Up Flowers. And these flowers popped up all over the place in New York City. This is called public art, art that is out and about, not in a museum, but out and about. And they're larger than life. So one thing that, to notice about these is the scale. Um, these flowers are giant, and in comparison, the people look really tiny. 
that's not the way it normally is. We're normally giant and the flowers look very tiny. So by playing with scale, the artists have given it sort of a larger than life or playful thing. Flowers are something that brings us joy when they're small. So would the same thing happen if they were to be really big? This is one of the questions that the artists might have asked themselves when creating this. I was lucky enough to be visiting the city in 2018 and I got to see these beauties for myself. One thing to know is that just by looking at them, you can almost tell what material it is. They're inflatables. Um, these are something that, that we sort of have memories of as children. A lot of us have jumped on those inflatable houses and those feelings are sort of attached to that positive feeling. Another thing to consider about material is expense. If these artists had to create this, what if they had built this material out of metal? Would they be able to move it out of the way? Because these were temporary sculptures. These are not there all the time. It might be a traveling exhibit that they actually take the artwork to another city and display it somewhere else. If these were metal, that would be very hard to do. Plastic and inflatable materials, very inexpensive, and you can get large things very quickly by blowing it up with air. In addition to the materials used and the scale of these sculptures, the title actually has a lot to do with how we see them. Sometimes naming it something can change the way we even feel about an artwork. In this case, all of the flowers were given names, and because they're given names, it almost looks like they take on a personality. The purple flower, his name is Wilt, and the word Wilt means for a plant to sort of start drooping as it dies. And that makes this kind of sad. So this one almost gives us a feeling. The one on the left is called Teddy. And it actually looks sort of like a big fluffy teddy bear that you want to hug. It makes us connect to them in some way. I hope these artists and images that I've shown you today have given you uh, some ideas and getting your creative juices flowing. I hope that you're able to take some of these and use them to inspire your own flower-centered art.